In this video, we're going to be going through uh, materials from bonding, which is 3.2, through to metals, which is um, uh, 4, and then eventually joining materials fabrication, which is um, M5. So, uh, we're starting at bonding, and what we know is there's three primary ways that things can bond. So we've learned about valence electrons, and the three primary ways that things can bond is through ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and metallic bonds. Ionic bonds happen when we have a positive ion and a negative ion. So the classic example that people seem, seem to use is table salt. We have NaCl, which is um, sodium chloride. So in this case, we have a an ion that, is, so metal ions are usually, they've lost an electron, so metal ions are positive. And uh, non-metal ions have gained an electron, so they are negative. Um, okay, so... In this case, we have a lattice, right? So we, we've seen um, we get uh, had it. so ionic crystals. They form a lattice, and so in this case, we have so maybe positive ions, negative ions, positive ions, and they're in a very rigid, ordered lattice. Unlike um, other structures, there's no flexibility. If uh, if you shatter that lattice, if you distort that lattice at all, it shatters. So what we typically consider these uh, materials is that they, they're more likely to be hard than uh, other, uh, other bonding formations, but they're more likely to also be brittle. So in this case, we have table salt, which is Na and Cl ions. So it looks like the sodium is the little one. Okay, so we're going to go back. Um, so what do we know about them? Ionic bonds typically dissolve in water. Ionic bonds are poor conductors of heat and electricity, but when, dissol uh, when dissolved, the now free ions conduct electricity. Um, now, I generally don't like that bottom line, but I guess I have it in there because it's worth saying that water, it, it's distilled water should not conduct electricity. But it does because the dissolved ions can sometimes conduct electricity. You don't really need to know that. All we need to know Continuing. Um, covalent bonds, atoms, usually nonmetals, can share their electrons in covalent bonds. A classic example here would be... Um, oh. So I just want to quickly mention that rust and most um, ores, so metal ores, they usually occur in ionic bonds. Water, H2O, the dioxygen we breathe, which is O2, and ozone, O3, they're all covalent bonds. Organic chemistry, which includes living things, as well as plastic and petrol, are based on carbon-based covalent compounds. If you look at um, my notes here, I have this picture, and... What is the problem with this picture? It's a good guess. It's not right. It's organic. So, what is sea salt? The table salt is what? NaCl, which is a it's a ionic bond. Only covalent bonds that are carbon carbon based can be organic. Yeah, by definition, only things that are, co are covalent co compounds that are carbon based can be organic. So, plastic can be organic. All living things are or organic, or at least all living things on Earth are organic. Table salt, though, ionic, can't be organic. Okay, metallic bonds are when crystals um, are crystals of metal ions, so I-O-N, surrounded by a cloud of electrons. The free electrons allow for good conductivity. Um, so later what we're going to learn about alloys as solid solutions, and they're covered in um, chapter 2. Um, I've got the, the page number there. But to quickly show you the notes for that so when we looked at everything that's made of atoms i have on that post i have different kinds of solutions so i was looking at my daughter's chemistry notes yesterday and she saw she had um are they soluble and she said metals are typically not soluble and i said well that's not true we know that there can be solid solutions and so in this case in the case of brass what we have here is brass we have um well we're going to learn that so brass is zinc and that zinc can be dissolved in copper. So typically we think of solutions as being whether or not they dissolve in water, whether or not they dissolve in a solvent. We're going to learn more about those terms, so solvents and solutes. I do have um, those notes here, right? So I have um, the definitions of what a solvent is. It comes from Duxters. Anyway, uh, so thanks, Duxters. Anyway, um, I have my Feynman lectures. I don't some Feynman lectures. I don't know if I spoke about that with you guys. Did I speak about that last time? No, there you go. So, um, so the Feynman lectures. When, when we say that everything is made of atoms, that's the li that's pretty much the first line of uh, Richard Feynman's uh, lectures on physics. These are probably the most famous um, physics textbooks, and um, 
he says, not on the first page, but pretty close, that if all knowledge was to be lost, what would we, what would the phrase that we'd want to have be passed on, which is that the uh, the concept that conveys the most information, the fewest words, is that all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling each other when they're squeezed into one another. That's um, Feynman's line. So when we say everything is made of atoms, I think it's a great starting point whenever we're thinking about uh, the chemical level in engineering. Okay, so um, when we continue on, what we're looking at, looking at here is with metallic bonds, what we have is positive ions, because remember, um, metal ions, they've lost an electron, so they're positive. And they're surrounded by all of this, all of these electrons. These are all the electrons they've lost. They just float around, and they don't really bug any any particular ion for that long. So that they couldn't, they're all they're all positive, and those ions just keep floating around. But because that means that there's lots of free electrons that are able to move, because of this, the lattice is not rigid. You can hit a metal, and you can leave a mark, and it won't it won't shatter. Yeah, you can dimple it where, rather than having it shatter because there's a flexibility that this um, these ions they can just rearrange themselves if they need to the free electrons allow for good conduction of electricity and um, heat uh, so I maybe mentioned no I, in another recording I mentioned that uh, about copper my mother is a chemistry teacher and she teaches the same topic as well and the analogy she taught me when I was a kid was that she likes to think of dads at a barbecue so there's a whole bunch of dads, and they all go meet up. Maybe you know, I don't. Know, they go meet up at, at a barbecue, and they all bring along one or two kids. And to be honest, they don't really. It's not like they don't like their kids. They just they want to hang out with the dads. And so the kids, the kids are there, and they just say, "Look, you guys just run around and just figure it out." And so all the dads, they're they're doing their dad thing, and they're free to you know walk around. And no dad is specifically. They can't specifically see their kid, but they can just see kids. And they're, they're, they're confident that if there was a problem, one of the dads would fix it, you know, would sort it out. So, you know, it's sort of supervision just through, uh, you know, um, a, a community supervision rather than direct supervision. So these electrons are the kids running around, you know, doing whatever they're doing. And the dads are just sort of keeping an eye out. And um, that's the way that he, she, I think of, uh, that's the way my mum taught me. And that's now I think of metallic bonds. If that helps you, that helps you. Okay, secondary bonds, they are covered in the textbook. Um, I don't have a page. So they call it, in the textbook, they call it intermolecular forces. And this is the bonds that join uh, things beyond these three forces. So the way of looking at it, so now, when I recorded this last time, I went into a lot more detail. But if we look at something like H2O, how do the H2O molecules... So, one second, I will get a picture of H2O. Okay, so... <laughs> when we look at H2O, we can see <clears throat> that the hydrogen only has one electron, uh, um, and the oxygen only has one electron. But in this pairing, the sorry, the the oxygen only has um, six. But in this pairing, they effectively share their electrons to have complete outer shells. Hydrogen only needs two; to, they only need to gain one to get to two to have a complete outer shell. And oxygen needs to as well. So they, effectively, they share the electron. And what this does is it creates an area of positive charge around the hydrogen atoms and negative charge around the oxygen atoms. And so what this means is when you have lots of H2O around, um, I'm trying to look at when you have lots of it around, they have there's a weak bond. There's a weak bond that joins from one molecule to the other. So we can see that an individual molecule looks a bit like Mickey Mouse, yeah? But between those, there is a bond, a secondary force, which we can call intermolecular forces, that join. So these were originally called Van der Waals forces, but I think during one of the wars, I think World War I, they're like, nah, we, we, you know, we don't want to name things after the Germans, so they instead called them London forces. And now we call it like secondary bonding. Anyway, so the point is, I'm not going to go into too much detail. The fact that um, I've covered so little information, but what we can write here, secondary um, bonds. Also, if you want to write van der Waals, you can. You don't have to, but they um, they are the bonds between molecules. Okay, so explain why ionic bonds are brittle. 
Anyone? A rigid structure, yeah, between positive and negative ions. Yeah, the electrostatic forces uh, don't allow for disruption to the crystal lattice. Something along those lines. Okay. Identify an engineering application of covalent bonds. Where do we use covalent bonds? Hmm. Polymers. Exactly right. That's that's what I would like to see. Um, obviously, some people would say petrol is an engineering application, so that's another one that you can write. Um, so polymers are mostly made from the same process. When we distill uh, crude oil, we get polymers. We also get octane, which we use in petrol, obviously. We get diesel. We get natural gas. Okay. Next, we have crystals. Boys, so atoms in solids are either crystalline or not. Now, we just saw before that ionic bonds, they form crystals. And we saw that metallic um, metallic bonds, well, we said that they form a lattice or a crystal of ions. Yeah, so in both cases, they're, they're crystals of ions. And so we think most things, most solids, uh, well, I say most solids, many solids, um, they're either crystalline or not. Now, that word is amorphous. That really should have been a blank so that you had to fill it in. I guess maybe because it's a bit hard to spell. Amorphous solids don't have a crystal structure. The best example of this is glass, but some polymers... Oh, it's probably going to be an ad. Some polymers are also amorphous. So uh, acrylic, styrofoam, or polystyrene, I should say, polycarbonate, uh, vinyl, and ABS, which is what Lego is made out of, they're all amorphous. And other ones like uh, polyethylene and polypropylene, the two most common, they're semi-crystalline. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that amorphous means non-crystalline. That's all you need to know. Okay. So I once had a, um, I'm going to say an argument with my father-in-law over whether or not glass is a liquid or a um, liquid or a solid. Now, what does it mean for it to, something to be a liquid? Well, the textbook does have a definition of liquid, solids, and gases. So the idea is that if we have something like water, which we're very familiar with water in all three states, there's, a, there's some amount of water in the air that we're breathing now, right? When obviously we're, we're familiar with, uh, obviously we drink water and most of us have seen ice at some point in our lives. Okay, so the idea is that when we just looked at those H2O molecules, the strength of those intermolecular forces, so... I've been a little bit oversimplified. So those of you who do chemistry, you might know that there's also polar bonding and hydrogen bonding. But effectively, we can just say for our level, I mean, I don't even, I'm never going to give you a question on intermolecular forces anyway, secondary bonds anyway. But as temperatures increase, the molecules have more energy, so they're more able to break away from those intermolecular forces. Those intermolecular forces are much, much weaker than the primary bonds. So as the, the molecule gets more and more energy from the heat, it's more able to break away. So at low temperatures, the molecules don't vibrate very much. So they're going to form uh, they're going to form a more rigid structure. We call that a solid. Then as they start to get more and more energy, the molecules are able to slide over one another, but they don't have enough energy to break away from each other. Eventually, we get to gases which have enough energy that they can now. Uh, they can now leave each other and they can start moving around. Now, I do sometimes talk about... Um, okay, a bit of a segue. I didn't talk about this at all in the last recording. Um, fluids, right? So, what is a fluid? A liquid. Okay, that's a good answer. It's not entirely true. So, yeah. Okay, so something that's, that's able to move freely. Um, to be honest, I, I'd be interested to know what uh, the definition. A substance that has no fixed shape and yield, yields easily to external pressure. A gas or especially a liquid. Okay, so when we learn about fluids, we can find that um, when we put something like oil and water over each other, fluids these, those fluids don't dissolve into each other so that they create layers. The heavier fluid goes on the bottom, which in this case is water. Water goes in the bottom. But there's a joke that, if you're a physicist, you would say that the glass is neither half empty nor half full. It's 50% filled with water and 50% filled with gas. Yeah, because the gas, the glass is still filled with a gas, which is another fluid. If you put oil, water, and air in a glass, right? The air is around. The air is the lightest fluid, so it's going to fill the top of the glass. So the oil, which is the uh, the next, will go uh, the next heaviest, will go to the middle layer, and then the water, which is the most dense, is going to be the fluid that forms at the bottom. So the idea is that when we're talking about states of matter, that um, it's kind of it's a bit nebulous. You could say that um, gases are the lightest fluids. 
But um, And when you learn about fluid dynamics, they can just as easily mean gases or liquids because they behave in a more similar way than solids do. Um, what we're interested, though, is that is glass a liquid? Now, the reason people think that is because they see old churches and they see that the glass is usually heavier or thicker on the bottom than it is on the top. Now, that's just because when you make glass, so there's a method called glass blowing, and you spin the glass out, and you, you get an area that's thicker than the uh, the outside is thicker than the inside. I think it could be the other way around. The point is, when you're cutting the glass, the glass workers would put the heavy glass on the bottom rather than the top. But occasionally, disproving the idea that it's just that it's melting very slowly, um, I'm just going to go with the term of viscosity. The fact that some of these can be put upside down proves to us that they're not liquids. Now, uh, so what we have here is water. Water can be poured out at a rate of one, right? A viscosity of one. Oil, has it's a thousand times slower at pouring out. It's a thousand times more viscous. Honey is ten, sorry, a hundred times, not a thousand. And honey is 10,000 times more viscous than water. And then, if this continues, we can then see pitch, which is 230 billion times more viscous. And so the University of Queensland is running the world's longest experiment, which um, over the years that it's been tested, it's only had nine drops fall. So you can see the time between drops, right? So that was uh, 12 years. Um, yeah, in 90 years, only nine drops, one, roughly one drop every 10 years. Um, so uh, glass... Is, is, is a solid. It's an amorphous solid. It's not a liquid. Also, we have Roman glass. And when you consider that Roman glass is five or six times older than medieval glass, if it was melting, so to speak, if it was slowly, if it was just a super viscous um, so liquid, well, it would be a puddle by the time we were getting to Roman glass because Roman, is, Roman glass is five or six times older than medieval glass. We've learned that there are crystals. What kind of crystals are there? Unfortunately, so there's three different types, FCC, BCC, and HCP. Now, unfortunately, I haven't matched them up in the right order. This is HCP. If you want to label that, if you want to write underneath, this is HCP. That makes sense. It looks hexagonal, and it's going to be the H1. This one, we've got a one atom in the body. In the body. Yeah, so it's going to be body-centered. Here, we can see that we have six atoms, one atom in each face. Face-centered cubics include um, aluminium, nickel, gold, uh, copper, lead, and gamma steel. Body-centered cubics include chrome, magnesium, and um, alpha steel, or ferrite. And hexagonal close-packed metals include cadmium, titanium, and zinc. Some metals, uh, before I go on, I'll quickly talk a little bit about that. So if we go back to... So there's also something called a simple cubic. We don't really learn about simple cubics. I have the picture here, but don't worry about it. Where people originally became interested in this is they became interested in this when they were stocking, stacking cannonballs. And they found that if you stack things as face-centered cubics, you can fit more cannonballs in the same area than if, than if you stock them as body-centered cubics. Uh, it's also been found that HCP, so hexagonal close packed, have a very similar um, stacking rate. I can't quite see the atomic cell, but I'm pretty sure that, oh yeah, HCP I think has a pretty, pretty close stacking rate. Um, not something I care about. I'm just saying that as a point of interest. Um, so typically, BCC is more brittle than FCC, and I'm pretty sure HCP is the most. Um, so BCC is brittle, and so HCP is the most brittle. Point is, you don't need to m remember that. Now, in chapter three on page one one one, we'll learn more about a, another kind of crystal structure called BCT. BCT is halfway between these two. In the transformation, um, we get something called BCT. It's called martensite. Well, the specific one we're interested in is called martensite. Martensite's a big deal. We're going to be learning about martensite a lot, but we're not ready to talk about it yet, so we're going to ignore that. Okay, so I've got a question. What do we call a non-crystalline -crystal solid? Amorphous. What do we call materials that exist in multiple crystals? It starts with P. Did I, I may have skipped this line. Polymorphous. Did I skip that? I think I did. Some materials can exist in multiple crystal structures, so poly, and they're called polymorphic. So tin, carbon, so we were aware that carbon can exist as graphite or as diamond. That's because it has different crystal structures. 
So one is a hexagonal structure, the other one is a tetragonal structure. Steel, we saw above, right, we have gamma steel and alpha steel, austenite and ferrite. They can be different structures. And that transition is how we make martensite. But we're going to learn about martensite later. Okay. We're now on to metals. So when we're talking about metals, all, all materials, when we learn about the classification of materials, they can be classified as metals or non-metals. Now, I like to think about how Elon Musk, he, ha he sold not flamethrowers. They clearly were intended to be seen as flamethrowers, but he, for legal reasons, said that they were definitely not flamethrowers. They just were things that happened to shoot fire. Um, but I like the idea that the, you can have these binary things, which you can say that everything, to a certain extent, is either a flamethrower or not a flamethrower. So, for instance, surfboards, they're not flamethrowers. Soccer balls, not flamethrowers. Right? Um, hair ties, not flamethrowers. Right? Really, only flamethrowers are flamethrowers. But all of the materials we look at can be classified as either metals or non-metals. So non-metals contain... Um, Ceramics, polymers, and uh, ceramics, polymers, and composites. And if we look at the um, the periodic table, if I just go to that, we have groups of metals and non-metals. So if we look at this table here, we can see that of, of our elements, we have metals and we have non-metals. Now, just quickly to recap, when we talked about everything being made of atoms last time, one of the things I said is I made the claim, just while I've got a periodic table in front of me, is that we said that um, there's about 100 elements. And you might say, but puns, there's clearly 118 elements. Yeah, okay, maybe there's 118 elements. There's 92 naturally occurring elements. That gets you to uranium. I also said that plutonium, there's very, very, very tiny amounts of plutonium that are in you. Because when uranium dec decays, it sometimes makes plutonium. But we're talking tiny amounts. You can't dig up any plutonium. You can dig up uranium. And then, number 95, americium. That did not exist before humans created it. Maybe it did, but it didn't, in, not in our solar system. We have no evidence that it re requires intelligence for um, americium to be created. I used to pronounce it um, americanum. I can't think of how I used to pronounce it. I'm hoping that americium is the correct spelling. Anyway, um... In your notes, I will show you a picture of a guy, or oh, am I going to go to titanium? For valences, I pointed out some other things that also are called valence, including the bed sheet that goes on the bottom of your bed, and there's a singer, and there's a city. Um, so this guy here, this guy, he, w he wanted to build his own nuclear reactor at home, and so he went and stole all of the smoke detectors because smoke detectors, they have americium. Now, americium, it exists, I'm hoping I'm saying that correctly, it exists in large enough quantities that we can put it in smoke detectors, right? It's a real thing that you can pick up and hold. But once we start getting to these white elements, we don't even know if they're metals or not because they exist for like a fraction of a second. They exist so briefly that we can't really pick them up and hold them and, you know, do anything with them. So they do exist, like, They've been created, they've been synthesized, but they, they decay so quickly that we really... Anyway, I'm going to move on because I'm not a chemist and you know, this is outside of my area of expertise. Um, okay, so what we're going to look at now is that the main group of... Within the metals classification, the main one that we're interested in is ferrous metals. Now, I had said in my other video I was going to get the uh, the song, Oh Yeah, from Ferris Bueller Day Off, but I didn't get that ready, so you'll just have to imagine. I mean, Ferris Bueller, it's like a 40-year-old movie, so probably isn't all that relevant. Anyway, but the point is, I use a different image for um, ferrous metals. Instead, I use this picture for ferrous metals. What's that picture? That is from Iron Man. I remember at the end of Iron Man, I was disappointed that... Um, like, at the end, they do play the song Iron Man. But the best part of the song Iron Man... I am Iron Man! Where he talks into the fan. And in the movie, because it's um, it's an instrumental, they don't have the lyrics at all. I'm like, you miss out on the best part of the song where you say, I am Iron Man. And then a student last year, for the first time, pointed out to me, it's like, yeah, that's because Tony Stark is giving the press conference and S.H.I.E.L.D., Phil Coulson and S.H.I.E.L.D., they want him to deny that he's Iron Man. And he says, the truth is, the truth is, I am Iron Man. And it kicks off into the song. So he, Tony Stark, oh, mind blown. I tell you, that guy who made the Iron Man movies, you know, who played Happy in Spider-Man. 
and made the Mandalorian just genius, right? Anyway, um, okay, I have some other links. When you're looking at this, you might think, why is there a Thai version of Iron Man? That's a good question. This one, this one, it's not even about Iron Man, which Iron Man is actually a pretty great song. It's about this guy who goes back in time to stop the apocalypse, and he becomes the thing, Iron Man, that creates the apocalypse because he's so angry. It's a pretty interesting thing. You have to kind of read into the lyrics a little bit there, but I think it's pretty cool. Anyway, this song is not about that at all. This is about how the prices keep rising. Yeah? Anyway, um, there's even better than that, and that's pretty cool, is this Iron Man 3 remake, and it is just... I, every time I watch it, it just makes me so happy that they this guy has just filmed a scene-for-scene scene remake, but it's super low budget. It's it's just delightful. It's just... Anyway, um, so just check it out, especially if you do multimedia. It's just delightful. Okay, so Iron Man. Um, I do have a link there from Real Engineering where he talks about iron a bit more, more depth. Okay, so ferrous metals contain predominantly iron, believe it or not. Now, predominantly means more than 50%. The reality is that it's usually more like 80 or in the case of like mild steel, like over 90, well over 90. But okay, and it's predominantly iron. When they have got the atomic symbol Fe. Fe is for Latin ferrium. In French, it's fer. If, so um, the chemin de fer is the road of iron. What do you think that might be? Choo-choo, the train tracks. Um... The most common is something steel. Nope, starts with an M. Mild steel. Mild steel with 0.3% carbon is everywhere. These tables are mild steel. The wheels would have mild steel in them. The uh, thing holding up the um, projector would be galvanized mild steel. That steel beam that's holding up the roof is mild steel. It's just everywhere, right? It's it's the most commonly used uh, metal, and it's probably the, one of the most commonly used engineering materials. I'm saying commonly, the other big contender would be concrete, and concrete contains mild steel. So, super common. Okay, now on the other end of the spectrum, I'm skipping a line you'll notice here, that I go from, so what is the scale? So at one end we have wrought iron, which has basically no carbon, low carbon, mild steel, medium uh, carbon steel, high carbon steel, and then cast iron is the highest. Now, very, very briefly, and I think I'm going to avoid telling the, the Rock Island Line song story, but there's a song that's all about pig iron. Um, I'm going to say I think it's good, but I mean, it's nowhere near as good as the Thai Iron Man song. And it's about this guy who's got a railroad and he's delivering live. He tells the, the toll man that he's delivering livestock so he doesn't have to pay the, the fine. He's got a sheep, but he actually had pig iron. And so he was like cheating the toll. And then, yeah, it's like a song. Um, anyway, pig iron has even more carbon than cast iron. It is way up there. It has the most. Um, it has like 6%. So the story, I, I just will say there's two stories that if I haven't told you in class, I'll tell you sometime when I'm not recording. Um, that two stories is so um, not only the, the pig iron song, but... Robert Menzies, who was a, a famous Australian Prime Minister, I think he was the longest, he was Prime Minister for longer than any other uh, Australian, uh, he sold a whole bunch of pig iron to Japan, and then Japan used that pig iron to attack a Australia during World War II, and so he got the nickname Pig Iron Bob, and my grandparents still refer to him as Pig Iron Bob. So, you know, sometimes names stick. So let's go back to that par par paragraph. So... Cast iron was used to build bridges before um, anything else. So Abraham Darby, he started working with cast iron. He then went and built, uh, he was responsible for the, the um, not far away, both of those were in Colebrookdale. He saw iron bridge get built. Iron bridge is directly above Zach. And iron bridge was built pretty much like it was made out of stone because iron uh, cast iron kind of behaves like stone more than it does like metal. It's only strong in compression. It's not very strong in tension at all. And then, uh, so initially people were very reluctant to use the bridge. I've already told this story, but after it showed that it was stronger than the stone bridges on the same river, it became more popular. But eventually, 
they started using wrought iron because it was preferable for bridges. Eventually, we got to steel, thanks to the Bessemer process, Henry Bessemer and the Bessemer process. And then we have, um, yeah, so which is in between. So we do have uh, in the book, we talk about where we use different carbon contents. So we use um, low carbon steel is... Oh, chains i think are low carbon steel mild steel is used for things like steel beams but it's used in all sorts of applications medium carbon steel is used in rails so steel rails like the chemin de fer uh, the high carbon steel is for things with like cutting edges so um uh knives and uh the high like very high carbon steel are used for th things like punches they're even higher so you might say medium carbon steel could be knives, but punches are always high carbon. And then cast iron is used for things like engine blocks, for casting. Okay, steel is useful because it is something and something. Can anyone give me an answer there? Strong and cheap. Okay, now, I like that answer, but the thing is, both of those answers are not really answers you should write in the HSC. What you should write instead in the HSC is that it has good tensile strength and steel has good compressive strength as well. So you should specify what kind of strength rather than just strength. And you could say that it's not cheap, it's um, very abundant, there's lots of it, and it's easy to produce. Now, if things are abundant and easy to produce, that makes them cheap. Aluminium is abundant, but not easy to produce, so that makes it slightly less cheap. Yeah. So rather than saying cheap, you should say abundant and easy to produce. But if you write cheap in that blank, I'm more than happy for you to write that in. And I will not mark you down, even if the HSC people will. The biggest problem with steel is that it is... It, sorry, the biggest problem with steel is something that starts with R. Rust. rust. Oh, I've got a song about rust. The Kingdom of Rust by the Doves. Anyway, um, I'm not going to put it on because, you know, we're, we're, it doesn't have any educational benefit. But who would have thought that, that would be the deciding line? Anyway, it's a good song. My um, daughter really liked that song. She used to listen to it when I took her to preschool. Anyway, the problem with rust is that um, the corrosion of steel compared to the corrosion of other metals is creates a, a vicious cycle, right? It creates a feedback loop. It keeps getting worse and worse. It keeps degrading more and more. This means that it is not durable, right? Not durable means that it doesn't last a long time. Durable is another word you're not allowed to write in, in the HSC. You have to say it's, it's, instead of saying something's durable, you have to say it's corrosion resistant, resistant to wear, uh, resistant to chemical erosion, uh, resistant to, uh, it doesn't biodegrade. That's the sort of thing you'd have to say instead of durable. Okay, define a ferrous metal. Dun, 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 dun. Contains iron. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, it, predominantly iron. And ironically, Iron Man suit, not an iron, al uh, um, iron alloy. I don't really remember. I'm pretty sure it's a gold titanium alloy. Okay, identify two advantages of steel. Bryn, tell me two advantages of steel. Yep, and one more. Yep. Abundant and easy to produce. Now, that is the best answer you could give. High tensile strength, and uh, it's also abundant and easy to produce. That is a very, very good answer. If you said strong and cheap, I'm still going to give that, mark that as correct. Okay, copper alloys. So when copper is mixed with 40% tin, it produces bronze, a metal that casts well that is brittle. When copper is mixed with 40% zinc, it produces brass, which is malleable, corrosion resistant, and can be used in brazing, a process covered in M5 3.1. Okay, so how do we learn this? The same way that I mentioned earlier that my mother is a chemistry teacher. When she remembers it, she just says, oh, I just remember that tin is old and zinc is new. And if that works for you, that's great. So in order to remember that zinc is new, I say zinc. And I remember that bronze medals were given in the Olympics, and the Olympics were really old. They're ancient. And cricket is when cricket players, they wear zinc. And cricket is new, right? It's much newer. Like 2020 cricket is really new, right? So they wear zinc. Zinc. I also have this rule that I call the rule of 1Z. So if we go here, you can see here, that this here, this fluffy guitar spin, this is the band ZZ Top, right? And they're spinning their fluffy guitars because they've got two Zs. You don't want two Zs. If you have two Zs, you're going to have a fluffy guitar spin. It's bad. So what we've got, this is from the song Legs by ZZ Top. And 
What's interesting is that in ZZ Top, every member of the band has a beard except for the drummer, whose name is something Beard. I think it's like John Beard. I don't remember. Anyway, so um, brass can be used. So brass is malleable, so it can be made into musical instruments. Do you see my Photoshop skills? This was like the first uh, Photoshop thing I made for engineering, and my skills were underdeveloped, which is why he's got four hands. But so brass instruments, they don't corrode, and they can be made into a sheet. Whereas bronze, it can be cast, and look, it can be cast into statues or pots. If you look on the back, there's a brass pot. But see here, we've got a statue. What's it the statue of? It's a statue of... We're off to see the wizard. Or if I only had a heart, dun, dun, it's the Tin Man. Yeah, so the Tin Man, did you get it? Tin, Tin Man, bronze statue of the Tin Man. Anyway, okay. Brass is an alloy of which two metals? So brass is an alloy of zinc and copper. Okay. Brass is also used in brazing, which also maintains the rule of 1Z. Brazing brass, yep. Anyway. Describe the properties of bronze. It's written there. Brittle, good casting. Okay. Uh, what we're going to finish on today is we're going to finish on aluminium alloys. Now, I do have a picture just like I have the brass picture for aluminium, but I don't use that until year 12. And so I'll keep that. Um, that I also have a song, Call Me Owl, by uh, Paul Simon. But... Um, Aluminium is used where corrosion is likely. So where's a place that gets wet whenever it rains? Yeah? Your windows. That's right. Your windows get wet. So your windows, they need to be corrosion resistant. Yeah? Or the other place where we care about aluminium is where we care about, so bikes and planes, what are the property that we what will you choose for aluminium? Lightweight. Lightweight. Yeah, low density. Um, now, so the Wright brothers, when they were building the engine for their plane, they needed a material that was light enough, so they used aluminium. And it was such an innovative um, technology that they painted their engine black so that no one could figure out how they could make an engine so light. I mean, I learned that from real engineering, so if that's, you know, that's my source, if that's rubbish. Um, okay, aluminium is also the best way, it's the best container, in terms of environments, the best container for drinks, because... Even though aluminium takes heaps of electricity to produce, it's the biggest use of electricity in South Australia, I believe, right? Don't quote me on that, but I believe. Um, it uses heaps of electricity to make aluminium, but it is easily recyclable. It uses about 5% of the electricity to make a recycled com can compared to making a new can. So you can recycle 20 cans, or maybe 15 cans, for the same amount of energy it takes to produce one can. The Napoleon III, he wanted to make... This is an apocryphal story. It means it's not true, but it's a good story. Yeah, I see. Um, he wanted to make armor and weapons out of aluminium, but it was so expensive because it needed so much electricity. Instead, he took the small amount he had, melted it down, and made knives and forks out of it. The most rich guests, they got aluminium knives and forks. Everyone else had to settle for gold. Okay. So I'm going to leave this with one question. What's the main advantage of aluminium? And corrosion resistant. Excellent. We're done.